Okay, time to start. Good morning, everyone. Right, so where we left off last week was with functions. And today we're going to continue with functions. And functions are fairly easy. They're not as hard or there's not as much, I think, to learn if you're completely new than all the weeks we had before, but they're very important. And there's a couple of things that uh, could cause a lot of misunderstanding. So I want to make sure that we kind of uh, visit functions again and again, because it's kind of um, one of the key blocks in programming, later on in C++ programming as well, uh, but also for C programming, functions are the most important part. This is how you divide up your code into p uh, manageable pieces that reuse each other, that you can give to other people as type of libraries or modules. Um, and therefore, you know, the function is really, really important. Now, we've seen last time that functions can call each other and that you can also have functions that call um, themselves, and that is called a recursive function. Um, and what happens then, as we saw, is that if a function calls itself, in memory, a new block is kind of reserved for the parameters that belong to that function. And the parameters are everything that is between the braces after the function name, the definition. And those are kind of available to you as variables for that particular point in time where that function is being called and being executed. As long as the function is executed, those parameters will be there. Those will be variables that are available to you. But once then the function returns, and every function returns at one point, then the, all that is gone. Then it will be wiped from memory. And this is kind of the stack um, of uh, the function itself that calls it, it, it shall itself each and every time, as we saw with the factorial function. But we have exactly the same also for uh, functions that call each other. And then I want to really specify one more time that this is not always as easy as it sounds. So therefore, I will quickly start another example. So I'll make a directory called test again. I'll also go here and test because I'm probably in the, yeah, in the main directory. And I will completely start from scratch again with a, uh, another program, which is not that hard. Typically, we um, give some description. I won't do that here. Um, we include, in this case, the IO stream. So we can give something out uh, to the terminal. And then, as we've seen, normally we always think about main and have so far always programmed everything into main. And uh, main always returns a number, an integer, as we've seen to the, to the operating system. <laughs> now, when we want to define a function ourselves, so a block of code typically that we want to reuse and reuse again that has a meaning, that's why it is a block, it belongs together, then we can call this function. And calling this function means you have the name of the function, let's call it A, and then we show C++ that it's a function because of the braces. And of course, like every statement, you have to finish it with a semicolon. And this is then, you can see that this is a function call of a function called A, which does not, not have any parameters. Right? So that is, that is, I think, a first thing. So let's not talk about parameters yet. We just talk about calling a function. Now, once you do that, if you would compile this, you would get the error, what is this A? We don't know A. So you have to define the function. And defining the function means you have to first say what the function will return. It could return any type that we've seen up until now, like integer or double or character. Um, but what we, have, what we haven't seen yet before as a type is void, because void means nothing. So we could also say explicitly to C++ that this function does not return anything. So in this case, our function A, with the name A, returns nothing. So therefore, we that's it void. And we have no parameters. Therefore, this is possible. So therefore, we basically um, open and then close immediately again uh, the braces. And then most of the time when you define a function, you then start with the implementation of the function straight away. So here on line 7, you have the definition of the function. You could also just put a semicolon here and then implement it later. But typically, we do this in one go. You say, basically, this is what the function A looks like. It takes no parameters, and it returns nothing. And then it can do something. For instance, it can output something to the terminal, something like hello. This is a very close thing to a Hello World application, in fact. Um, so this is basically uh, a function. And if we call it, you will see that if we execute our program, Let's save it and do that exactly. So g++ test.cpp. 
and we output this to the executable tests. And if we execute it, we'll see that hello is outputted. So basically, for now, we have a function that we can just execute, and it will then output hello to the uh, terminal. And you can do this again and again here. You can type three times A, brackets o braces open, braces to, uh, closed, um, and it will say three times hello. Now, that is not that hard, right? Um, the thing is that um, we can do this for multiple functions. So we can also create a function B. This is almost like the example that we've seen last week, where um, also this uh, B is doing something very similar. It does something that we are interested in and that during our program we might do again and again and again. And typically these are multiple statements that somehow belong together. That's why you always have the braces uh, for a function implementation. So in this case, we could just say hi, for instance, to sh show that we are having a different function. So also here, we could just um, execute uh, or call the function b after function a. And if we then recompile again and execute again, we have hello from function a and hi from function b. Again, not that hard yet, right? So the thing is that as we go on, we could call functions from each other. So you could say, and this will be typically done all the time, we could call function b from function a. And as we've seen last time, we can also call function a from function b. So they call each other again and again and again. Now this will result in a problem for the compiler, because the compiler, as we've seen, goes and reads from the top to the bottom and basically says first, okay, there is a function a, it's defined like this, and we're now going to implement it. The first thing that function A does is it outputs to the console the string hello and then an enter, a new line, and then it calls function B, but it does not know what function B is. Right? So that is the problem at the moment. We don't know at this point, the parser can only go from the top to bottom, what function B is. So therefore, in many cases, it does make sense to already first define the function A and define the function b, which is very simple. You know, we basically tell, tell the compiler there is a function a, it does not take any parameters and it does not return anything. There is also a function b, it does not take any parameters and it does not return anything. From that point on, it is possible to tell the compiler now we call function b. Because the compiler will then keep a table with all the functions that it has and basically then uh, knows where to jump to in the program code. Uh, to find out what function B is. And this is over here. So this is where this is being defined. Now, as I said last time, and this is something that most of you already have experienced, if you would uh, run this, what happens then? Hello, exactly. So basically, you constantly get hello, hi, hello, hi, hello, hi, hello, hi. But from last week, we know from the slides that what happens is that a function A calls function B, function B calls function A again, but each time a function is called, one of those colored blocks is added into memory, right? It's not like function A has a piece of memory and function B has a piece of memory, and they just stay there and they basically call each other the whole time. No, basically you create a new piece of memory again and again and again. So with each hello and each hi you see then in the terminal scrolling by, your memory is filled up bit by bit. And that is very important to know because that is usually the type of problem that loads of softwares, when they crash, have. It's usually an infinite loop where a memory leak exists and a memory leak means you're filling the memory even though you did not intend to do this. So let's do this now just as a, as a um, teachable moment. So we compile this. This works, right? And now when we run this, we will see hello, hi, hello, hi, as you just said. But what will also happen is that this probably will not go on forever. Eventually, the memory that is reserved on the server for me is going to be filled up, and I predict that there will be a core dump or a crash somehow. Oh, did not take that long at all. So I think after a couple hundreds of highs and hellos, my memory is full, and indeed, we get a segmentation fault core dump. They see my program crashed, I had a memory leak. Right? And this is quite important. Whenever you call a function, in memory you reserve some, uh, some space for that function and it always takes a little bit of space. So basically uh, the stack is being filled up. Yes, you had a question? It's not loop. How is it possible to call that 
It, yeah, yeah, that's a very important thing that you just said. It's not a loop. Well, in a way, it is a loop. It is an endless loop. And in this endless loop, you basically reserve some memory again and again, each time you iterate through this loop. And this is, of course, uh, another way of looking at it. By having something like this, or having also recursive functions, you can implement loops as well. If a function calls itself, like the factorial function that we've seen, you could uh, uh, implement the factorial function as a loop, but you could also implement it as a recursive function. And it does not always make sense to implement it as a recursive function because this will mean sometimes, if you run this uh, many times, that your memory gets filled up quite quickly. And it's not always nowadays with the computers that we have a problem of the memory itself. It's mostly about the memory management, that your computer needs to fill up a table with, which says, you know, I have now executed the function B thousands of times. Uh, I'm done with this. This is, uh, this is going wrong. So basically, it's not really about the physical memory being filled up, but it's about this stack of um, blocks in memory being managed or becoming unmanageable. And then your, your computer gives up, basically. That's what typically happens. Yeah. But in a way, this is a loop. We are executing the same thing again and again and again. So it is a loop, but it has a different form. It's a loop where we jump between pieces of code, but each time we jump to the new function, we create also a new block on the stack in memory for that function. Somebody else? Are you at a question? I have a question. The price completion, I don't know if you <laughs> Yes. But then it's run from top to down. Yeah. <laughs> let, let me just, let me, so we have basically come up come to the front and show you, but basically here we define the functions. A and B, A. but then you didn't assign anything to it. You didn't assign any value to the function or anything. Functions like don't have values. Okay. Functions only return values sometimes. In this case, they don't return anything. So functions are completely different from parameters, uh, from variables. Mm. That is quite important. So my question was that nothing was just like how mm -hmm. you, let's take it as you assign something. How is it that you get to function A and then it, it has to call function B whereas nothing was assigned to it? That was my question. Right. But so basically at uh, line 8, it's, it's very important that question. At line 8, the compiler knows that there is a, a, a B function. So it knows and it also knows everything it needs to know at that point. It says there is a function B, its name is B. It has no parameters, and it doesn't return anything. From then onwards, it's no, whenever B is called, at least it can check whether this is for called properly. So at this point on line 12, it will be able to do this. And at the same time, somewhere else, the compiler keeps kind of like a, a little table, uh, you know, like, like an Excel table, basically, where you kind of sco store which functions are known and then later, and only later, you worry about the implementation of those functions. That means whenever you call the functions, you know what sequence of actions need to be taken. In this case, line 11, line 12. And for function B, it's line 16 and line 17. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's important to know this. C++ does not need to immediately implement a function straight away. You can say first, I define these two functions and the definition will give the compiler, C++, everything it needs to know. And then you tell, them, uh, you tell the compiler that you will later implement this. We could have also implemented these two functions behind the main function. Not a problem. Well, it was uh, like in line 10. So I first we define it, after that we make the development code. Why? Why do we need to do that? Yeah. that uh, because this allows also functions to call each other and to functions, to, so A and B would not be possible to be used if we did not have these two lines 7 and 8 here. Because in that case, at line 12, the compiler would not know what function B is. That is basically the, the, the little practice that we have here. The compiler first parses the entire code, and whenever it sees something, keywords or variables or whatever, then it will assume that this is a function, but it knows that it's not in its list of functions that it knows if we didn't have that line 8 over here. In the but C program, we have a line 10? Yes, C is also exactly like this. Yeah, and C++ as well. Yeah. OK? Yes, another question? In the, in the course of sessions, when we have to write, mm -hmm. and then I didn't know that um, at some point, I'll have to call another function 
and another time. Mm -hmm. But then he didn't say, are you going to neutralize by the voice, even voice in it? Right. So with that, and my, my paper is for that. With that, how do I initialize those passwords? Uh, I'm not sure if I, I mean, basically initializing is not something that happens to functions. Initializing is something that happens to variables. Right, a variable is a, sp is a space in memory that you can give a value, basically. A function is a block of statements that do something. And this block of statements is between the curly braces. So basically, whenever you call A, like here in the main function, actually calling A is something that uh, we could have done already because B was never called, as you see here. Um, I'm not sure what this US is the whole time here. Okay, it's gone. So basically, um, whenever we call A here in the main function, we execute those statements that belong to A, namely the ones in line 11 and line 12. That is what a function does, right? So that is all. It jumps between your codes, really, and it, it groups code together in blocks that are given a certain function name, and that's it. Yeah, and that's how you should think about it. And again, there I think, um, implementing those things by yourself is probably giving you the insights you need to see that this is completely different from a variable, but that is also a very basic thing in programming. Functions are everywhere. In most programming languages, you have them, and it's important to know how, I mean, and they, they usually appear exactly the same like this. You had a question? It's defining the function. Exactly. It's basically telling the compiler, we have a function, so if we see an A appear somewhere, don't worry. This is a function that we promise we will implement. If you don't implement it, so if we would not implement B like we do over here, then of course the compiler goes in a second pass and then complains still. You promise to, uh, to implement a function B over here, but it was never implemented. But this is like a two pass thing. The first one is to see whether functions actually are defined. And the second thing is, what does the function do? And those are two things, because defining a function means we know that something, the user or the programmer in this case, has promised to provide certain functionality. And in the second pass, you do actually do what, uh, you jump to a, pr a particular uh, line in your code and then execute that code. That's how you should think about it. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Typically we do this, uh, so we would not uh, need in most cases line 7 and 8 here, but here we do, because otherwise we would get into problems here. Yeah. And we will see later, in a few slides in fact, that typically we do this as well if we want to create modules for our functions. Then we typically have a separate file which gives you all the definitions of the functions, and then we have a separate file where, where we implement the functions. But that's something that is coming up. Okay? But that is something that is quite important. And then, of course, what we can also do is we can create parameters. We could say that this has an integer, this A. Then we need to also implement it as such. And then whenever we are in this program, we have a variable I that we have to our availability. But in that case, we need to give this uh, parameter, this I over here, also a value. And that means whenever we call A, meaning over here, or over here, we need to give it an integer. That means we just give it a number, something like this, oops, would be perfectly fine, and that would work. Now what we'll see next is that if you do this, um, what is also possible is that we can give here an integer number, for instance, we give it immediately an initialized value, that is initialization. Then we can also not just pass the value 34 or the value, uh, the value 8, but we can also say that we pass number to this function. And that is the second most important part of functions. What we really do is we take the value of number, which is in this case 8, and we give that to the parameter of function a, i, right? So in this case, when we are in a, when we are over here, then we know that i is equal to 8 that we know then. And we have this uh, parameter available, this uh, variable. But what we don't have is if we leave this function and we basically change this i, in this case we say uh, i is seven in this case, what won't happen is that number over here will be changed to seven. 
And that is what I'm going to continue with. And that is very important as well, to know that this is um, the way things happen in this particular programming language, C++, in many others, but not in all of them. So some programming languages don't take the value of number, they actually pass number the variable itself. And in that case, if you change this, the value of this variable, this parameter of the function, then number in this case will have changed. But this is not the case in C++. But when you call B, mm -hmm. the A will, uh, number will be 20. Then it will be 23, exactly, exactly. So actually I should have, in order to make it really correct, it's like this, yeah. But I mean, this was just for the execution from the main function. Yeah, but you're absolutely right. That was a bit confusing. Let's do it like this. B never calls A and then we're fine. Okay? So in this case, um, we will have a completely different variable called, a, uh, called i, which is the parameter of this function. And this will have the value 8. And this i over here has nothing to do with number over here. The catch, however, is that we could call this number, right? And that makes it really tricky. We can do this because in this function, we don't know number. So we can just define a new variable called number, which is the parameter of the, of the function. And in this case, when we change number to seven, you might think in a first pass, right, so number after this line 23 is now not eight anymore, but it's seven. Look, it's changed to seven. But that's not true. What happened in this function over here is that we created a new variable, which is also called number, in for this particular uh, function. Once this function ends, this particular number over here, this variable, is gone. And this function, or this number over here, is a completely different type of variable, all right? I'm going to show this uh, a few more times because I think that is the, the harder part. So the, the idea here is call by value. Um, and call by value is what, what uh, most or many uh, programming languages do. That means if you have a function and, you ha and it has parameters between the braces that follow the function name, then those parameters, those variables really, become a value. They are not assigned to somewhere, uh, another variable that exists somewhere in our main function, for instance. That means we have two types of parameters typically when we think about functions. Whenever we define a function, we basically say we have a function called factor or factorial. It has only one parameter, namely a double, which is called n, and it returns a double. That's how we define the function. From then on, our parser or our, uh, our C++ um, will know that there is this function that will later be implemented. And then later, in some other function, we can call then this function. And we basically say we call this function factor, or we had called it, so we, we call this function. And we use now the parameter 6.0 as the actual parameter of our function. And uh, we assign then, because we know that the factorial returns a double, uh, we create a new variable called y, and then immediately assign this to whatever the function returns. And this is exactly the same as immediately initializing the variable y, not with a constant as we've typically been done up until now, but with a function. A function returns a double, and this double, the value of that is immediately given to y. And that is, those are two types, or the two things we do with functions. We define them, and we call them. And what I haven't shown yet is here that we also implement them. And that's that's way what we just uh, did. And this parameter is then called a formal parameter. Basically, this is in the definition, and that's how why it looks like uh, a normal variable, right? It's basically your type name or the type that this variable has plus the name of the variable. And when we call the function, we have an actual parameter, namely something with a value, right? In this case, it's a constant of, of type double. We can see that through the shape. It's a 6.0. And this 6.0 is the value that we give then to the variable n whenever this function is called. Right, so variables, if you give a variable here, like you create somewhere a double x before this line over here, and you, you say x is 6, and, uh, and in this case later, you say the factorial of x, that is perfectly possible. But what happens is that x, the value of x is taken, namely 6, 
and the six is then given to this double n over here when the function is called. Right? That is that is what what really happens. What is also possible is that you call the same variable each time. So in this case, we have that case. We have our maximum function that we saw earlier, which is taking two integers and returning an integer, namely the one that is bigger. In this case, it's perfectly possible to give a and then a again for the second parameter. That is normal because, as you know, what we take here is the value of a. So basically, we take 10 here, we take 10 here, and then these two tens are then plugged into, when our function is called, the two parameters of maximum, right? So we call, or yeah, we call by value in this case. So it's the value, not the actual parameter that is given to the function. So here's an example to kind of show this and also how people might cr um, create uh, misunderstandings and problems. So here we have a very small problem, um, a very small program, which is problematic uh, because we hope to include here a swap function that takes two parameters, x and y, and we hope that the values of x and y are swapped, right? So that's the idea here. And the way we do this is we create a temporary variable temp, we assign this to zero, and then we basically say temp becomes the, uh, gets the value of x, so temp over here, this is, we're going ahead a bit, but temp in this case is given the value 5. x is then the given the value of y, so x will be given 10. And then y is given the value of temp again. That was 5, so basically y becomes the value of 5. So if you run this, you would see that the values of x and y do get swapped. So the swap function does work, you would think, right? but it does only happen within the scope of this function. As soon as this function is ended, all of this is deleted, the whole blue block over here, and we go back to our main function. And it means from the point of our main function, our swap functionality does not work. Because in our main function, we have two integers, we call them x and y, they're initialized as five and as 10, as we've seen before, as is possible. And then we call our function swap with, in this case, the variables immediately, x and y. And this is perfectly possible. But what is happening really is that the, we take 5 and 10 here as values, and we plug those into the values of x and y over here. And that is slightly different than creating the whole, or the, than creating the variable, and then reusing this variable over here. So basically we have a variable x and y here, which have nothing to do with the variables x and y in our main function. Just like we had number uh, uh, just a few seconds ago in, uh, when I was programming. So when we uh, output over here, so what happens is you come into the, into the function, temp is set to zero, and then we go and execute all of this, so the values are swapped, as I said. But then as soon as we leave the function, we basically are back in our main function. And these two variables have never been changed because those two variables have nothing to do with those two variables here. We just copied the values. We could have also written five and 10 here. And that's, that's the idea. It just looks confusing because we're taking two integers here. And then perhaps if you didn't know C++ very well, you would have thought that uh, the values of X and Y were swapped here, but they aren't. Okay, yes. As global variables? Yeah. Yes. So uh, up until now, we have never seen global variables, and I also would uh, uh, ask you not to do that at all. But uh, y you're absolutely right. We could do this as well as global variables. It would, however, have exactly the same point, but you would not be able to um, get those two variables in main in that case. It's a scope issue. So as soon as you go into main and you have x and y defined away from main in the global, so basically at, at the top here, after the include uh, uh, line you would normally do, then you would not be able to redefine x and y in the main function, right? Because, because they are then, as, as, so basically as, as you enter the main, x and y are already there because they're global, and in this case they would be there again, and that would be a problem. Yeah, that's a 
that's a very good point, and thank you for saying that because that's what the next slide will show you. <laughs> um, but that's a good point because so this is this is a danger, right? If you use the variable names as parameters of a function, you just have to remember that we don't take the actual variable, we just take the value of that variable and give it to the function. That's all, right? As, as soon as you get that, there's no problem. You can use functions merrily as we have already. Um, but the problem is if, if you don't know that, then you might run into these type of problems. And the swap example is something that everybody always shows everywhere. It's the same for Java, it's the same for lots of other uh, programming languages. But, as you said, what we can do in a function is we can return a value. The problem is that this is only one value that we can return. We can just return one integer, or that's what we've seen up until now, right? And that means if we had swap, we still could not implement swap because we would have to return two values. And there's no way yet that we know about how to do that. We can only, so a function only returns at most one variable, so one integer, or one character, or one double, or one boolean, but that's it. That is a little bit, you know, uh, constraining us a little bit, but don't worry, we will soon see lots of possibilities of how to enhance that. So this is an example of, of, of your, uh, of, of the directs of your solution. So in this case, this function is just adding five to what you supply over here. Again, this is a little bit confusing if you look at the main function. So we have an integer variable x, we call it x, and we initialize it as 10. Then we pass this variable to our function add5. And if you look at add5, our add5 function takes an integer and it returns an integer. And as we already have seen with this operator, what is happening is that x equals x plus five. And that basically means at this point, when we had x the value 10, it will now have the value 15, right? That is, that is what will happen at this particular point. And when we return x in this case, and this is the new thing that we didn't do in the previous slide with swap, we return the value x or the value of our parameter x then we have basically this 15 in our memory, which we copy over here to where the function, uh, function was. So this function add five is then returning the value 15, which is then assigned to x over here again, right? So in that case, x has become 15. So our function did influence the value of our variable x. But again, this has nothing to do with the fact that we passed x over here. Also here, we just took the value of x, which is 10. We copied over here to a completely different variable x, which was over here than 10 as well. We added five to that, and then we returned that value. And that value over here is what this function returns, is then assigned to x. And it's the assignment that changed the value of x over here in our main function. It's not this over here, right? Those are two completely different variables, this, this x over here and this x over here. They just happen to share the same name, which is a bit confusing, but that's, that's of course uh, the intention here. I wanted to confuse you, but also that way you understand what this um, call by value really means. Whenever we have as a variable over here, a um, as a parameter over here, a variable, we don't take the variable itself, we take the value of that variable. What you could also have is here an operation like 10 plus five over here, which then gives 15 and the value 15 is then passed to this uh, value x, right? Or you could also have then 24 divided by two, which would give 12 and the value 12 is then given to this variable x over here. So at the same time, we have a, we have a two x with a two value mm -hmm. in the one program. So if we, I call x in the another part of the program, which one is us? Very good question. Yeah, so basically the question is, whenever I'm in a program, I could call x. If you call x here, we're talking about this x over here. So once you're in the function add five, we have no knowledge about what is happening in our ma main function. The main function called our function, but we have nothing about, we don't know anything about main. We just know that there is this one integer over here. 
we could also define some extra variables over here, just like the main function does, and create some, some variable x. We could also here create another variable. It can't be called x because that's already a parameter. That's the point here. But over here, in this scope, in this block between the curly braces, all we know is that there is one variable, which is a parameter of the function, and that one is called x. We don't know anything about any other variables. If we're in main, which is the other possibility, in this case, if we uh, have already passed this line over here, so if we bef are before this line, we don't know any variable at all. After this line over here, we know that there is a variable x, and it, has, and it does have the value 10. But that's about it. Also there, we don't know about any other variables. And that's how you should think about it. We could have another function call, uh, called a, for instance. In this function a, you would know nothing about this x over here or this x over here. Right? This is what we called three weeks ago the scope when we, when we first said we can create these blocks with curly braces anywhere. Well, now I'm transferring this to the function concept and I hope that this becomes uh, then clear. Whenever you're programming, from now on, we're not just programming in main anymore, where everything is nice and sequential, wi with the exception of loops, for instance, but uh, everything is still kind of sequential. In this case, now, we are implementing things in various functions. And whenever you're implementing in one function, all that function knows, all that you're programming, is what is there. You have this particular parameter, uh, as, a, as a variable, so you know x, but you don't know anything else. What happens in other functions, right? So these functions um, don't share anything. And what you just said earlier uh, with the global variables is one exception to that. However, shared variables are typically seen as very problematic in programming, and especially in C++ programming, you typically don't use global variables. They're forbidden in most of the style guides that people have, right? So that's something you should just try to forget about. This is coming from the old age where people were programming in C and where it used to be uh, um, ideal to have some global variables that were uh, running throughout the program. But typically, we look at a program as a set of functions which call each other. And if it's a program, if it's an executable, it will always have the main function, but typically the main function will call lots of other functions. Some of them might be your, some of them might be other functions because you included them um, as a module. Okay? Yes? Oh, very good. Thank you very much. I'm going to do this on the, sw on the, on the fly as well. Need to kind of... Um, uh, this is what I get when I want to do animations. Uh, it's not always that easy. But very, very, very good observation. Thank you. As I said, the slides are an ecosystem. They are... Uh, they could always have some errors. Thank you for, for noticing. Right, so now it's at five. Perfect, extra points for you. Great, so that is basically what you have to think about as well. You don't have to remember what call by value really means. That's something I would never ask at a, as an exam, but um, it could happen that you see a piece of code and if you create uh, to create something, then you should not fall into this trap. That's basically what you should be aware of. Uh, yes, here. Mm -hmm. yeah. So over here. When you call it, I think um, it will be using the ten over there and then ask exactly. for it in the main um, the main function, right? Yeah. So what happens when you initialize another value in that one? This one will it be if you would here use another value no, inside the add five um, function. We don't have another value. All we have in the add five function is what is given to us by the function call. So once we call the function add five here, we always need a value. And in this case, we take the value 10 because that's what we have. Mm -hmm. And that is then given immediately to this x over here. So in that case, it will be using the value, not the 10. Yes. But then what if you initialize another x in the add five um, function? Initialize the here as the, the parameters you mean? Okay, again, that we don't do yet, that will come later, but you can actually initialize things as a parameter, and then it becomes a default parameter. That's what, uh, what they say then. 
In this case, that would only happen if you don't explicitly give a, uh, a value here. So don't think too much about that yet. I mean, that will come as soon as we start talking about objects and classes and such. Um, but for now, whenever you call a function and the function has a parameter, you need to give a value. In this case, we gave the value 10 always, right? And that is then always here. And after this line, this value has been changed to 15. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So moving on. Um, we, so the next thing that I promised is now what we know functions, we're starting to get code that is a lot longer, a lot more complica complicated, typically. We already saw that last time with our maze game, the, which is the initial uh, version that we had. But typically, and that's something that most of, our, of you, I think, already have hinted towards, is it is possible to create your own modules. So up until now, we've just seen the main function. Everything in the main function is what we create as a program. Now with functions, you can split it up over multiple functions. And to create this, uh, to create this in a manageable way, we typically use this module concept where we split the definitions of our functions and put those in the header files. And the implementations of our functions, we put them in the CPP files. Up until now, we've just seen the CPP file where our main function was, and perhaps our extra functions. But what we can also do is we can create the functions and put them in the header files and CPP files away from the, the main file where our main function is. And that is a concept that is also new that I want to introduce here. <coughs> and we're going to see this as an example first for our uh, maze um, uh, example, and we're going to do something like this. I can't promise that we're going to do uh, implementation of exactly like this, but up until now we had maze.cpp, and last time we saw that we put something into different functions. We had this function over here, initialize n curses, which did the initialization of the color and our window, so that we could graphically draw on there, and it would already make it completely empty and give it a color, for instance. That is one function that we defined ourselves. The other one is draw. It would draw our player at an X and Y position on the screen. And so those were two functions that we created ourselves that we could call now in the main function. So that the main function you know, fits on one page still, but is also much more readable. You basically say, I mean, it, I'll quickly go over this again. I won't look at the include because that is something that our module will then be. But our main function basically initializes a character which is ha handling the output of the user or the input of the user, our x and y positions of our player. Then we initialize or call a function that initializes our screen. And then in a while loop, we do constantly, first we draw the player at this x, y position with this character and this particular color. Then we look at what the user presses on the keyboard. And depending on that, we either uh, go up, go down, go left, or go right, depending on the key presses W, S, A, or D. That's what we had last time. And then we saw that the switch statement here is a very nice example of dealing with exactly this. And this we do repetitively until the user presses the Q for quit, and then we end the window of N curses and then return zero to the operating system. So that is easy to read and that is still quite short. And we encapsulated then all the other code that we had initially, which is now under init, uh, init and curses and draw function. We basically exported that as different functions. So we have uh, these two functions over here, the init and curses, which does not take any parameters and does not return anything. It's just a sequence of commands to do things, uh, to initialize our window. And then we have a draw command, which basically draws at position x, y on our screen, this particular symbol with this particular color pair, as we've seen. And it does not return anything, it's a void. And then we see how they are implemented. So they're implemented like this. So these are all the commands that are belonging or that are executed when we, when we call this function init n curse. And these are over here, all the commands that are executed when we call our function draw, right? So what I did was explain how people then read that code. 
if it is split over different files. I hope you might have noticed this. This is the CPP file that, is, will, that will eventually then create our executable. And as you see here, it includes drawmaze.h. This is our file. We created a second file, which in this case has the extension h for header, which is this one over here. And the header file is then including, for instance, libraries that are needed. And it also shows you the definitions of the functions that we want to introduce, just like the a and b functions we had at the beginning, right? So up until now, our C++ has parsed these and knows exactly what is going to happen. So what happens really when, CP, uh, when C++ parses everything, it will include this particular file, and it knows that this file is in the current directory. That's what these quotation marks mean. Right, so it knows there is a drawmate.h file. I can just now open it and read this. It's basically exactly the same as copying all of this and putting those over here. Right, that is, that is exactly the same. And that is what is happening there. But we don't have any implementation, remember that. And that is a bit weird up on this point. Because there is no drawmaze.cpp at all here or here, but we are going to create that cpp file. And what so is this the address for drawmaze.h? Draw Sorry? What is the addresses in our computer? What is the root file? So there's two files up until now. So there's so maze.cpp. In one folder? Yes, in one folder, there's maze.cpp, and in the same folder, there's drawmaze.h, which is this one over here. And these are the contents, right? So that's so far quite manageable, I hope. But the weird thing is, there's also a drawmaze.cpp, right? It's exactly the same name as drawmaze.h, the header file. And that creates, or basically, has the implementations of the functions that we promised to include. And it includes these as well. So it includes the header file, so the definitions of those two functions, and then it implements those two functions. It implements init and curses as a function, and it implements, so this is the continued lines of draw maze.cpp, it also implements the draw function over here. Okay? So if, if the draw maze.h in the different folder, we should write a folder before? No, there's, yeah, exactly. So if, there's, if there were a folder here, uh, different types of folder, we could also add the paths here. Yes. But typically, for most of our projects, we will use always the same folder, by the way. It's much easier. You will see that, that, uh, that this creates something that is manageable. So to kind of look at this as a structural thing, it is not that hard. I mean, those of you who have already been programming in an integrated development environment, an IDE, will know that typically you always do this. You kind of create functions, you say that you define them in a header file, you implement them into a CPP file with the same name, and then in your main functions uh, file name over here, you just implement main, and you then point to what uh, type of files you're, you're going to use. Yes. So, so the, when the main function works, uh, it should search for the drone with H? Yes. No, 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 it won't do that. And that is, of course, what I, it means that we have to start whenever we compile this, we have to do a lot more work. We can't just compile mage.cpp anymore as we had before, because there's no pointer here, apart from the name, perhaps, that points to the actual implementation over here. So that means we have to start doing a lot more work uh, with uh, G++ to say what should be compiled where and when. That is the difficulty of modules, but it also has a lot more advantages in that case as well. Those will come in a second. But it's a very good question, right? So do we then just say G++ maze.cpp and a minus O maze, for instance, as I did earlier? No, we have to do a lot more. And that is this over here. So basically, whenever we want to now create our, the code for our functions, we have to do this separately. That means we have to compile, and that's why we have this minus C here, we have to only compile this particular code, which is the implementation of our functions. We have to also link the ncurses library because our functions use the ncurses library. And what this line will do 
is it will create an object file. And this object file will then um, uh, afterwards be able to kind of like puzzle pieces stick together to other object files we're going to create. And all of those object files together will become then our build executable, our program. Right? A little bit hard perhaps, but we'll see this in action in a second and I hope this will kind of spur then um, or, or will give you a little bit more information. Remember that this is exactly what we said in the first week. So we program in something that is a text file. We still do that. We have the header files now in the CPP files. In the header files go the definitions of the functions. In the CPP files go the implementations of the functions. And then we create not directly our executable, but we go for intermediate step where we create these files, that the o, dot .o files, which are object files. They, they already contain machine language, and this machine language is kind of grouped for all the functions that we have. And then later when we call a function, we basically immediately execute this machine language. It's basically like linking the functions together that we have, and that is then uh, the next step to create our, op uh, our executable. So we do this for our drawmaze.cpp file, and we do this for our maze.cpp file. So we have an object file that, that kind of creates all the code that belongs to our two functions that we created ourselves. Our init and curses function and our draw function. So that those two are put into drawmaze.o by executing this line over here in the terminal. By executing this line over here, we create a maze.o file, which is basically the object file for our main function. Right? And those are the three functions we had up until now, init and curses, draw and main. These two are implemented in this object file over here. These two, uh, the, our main function is implemented over here. And then what we have to do in a third step is take those object files and then build our executable maze. Again, with linking the end curses library. Right? And that's basically going from the object files to an executable, as we've done up until now. Up until now, we only had the main function and sometimes we had a main function plus our own function, but those were always in the same file. So therefore we could always skip this step over here and create our executable straight away. We didn't have to go for this compile step. Uh, so this minus C means compile, and compile means we only create this object file. We don't create the executable. If you leave this one out, then it will take the object files or straight the CPP file that is added here, and then create the executable, as we've done before. That is the only difference. Now this is exactly what happens if you go for a very nice IDE, like Visual Studio C++, for instance, or Visual C++ Studio. Um, basically, if you go into that, then you see usually loads of files, header files and CPP files, and then you click this play button typically to start or to compile your program, build your executable, and then run your executable. Um, all these steps are typically then taken for you, automa automated for you. And that's also what we can do uh, ourselves, that's what we're going to see in a second. So basically, we use our modules so that we can better structure our codes. We divide our code into different functions, and to not have to put all those functions in the same CPP file, we can create those functions that belong together into a header file and CPP file. We define them in the header file, we uh, implement them in the CPP file. And what is then possible is that this can be created as an object file, and this object file is then finished. If we don't add anything to those functions anymore, or if we don't change them anymore, this object file is done forever. And if we then keep on working on our main file, our main function in this uh, CPP file, then all we have to do is create this object file and then link it with the uh, object file that we already have, right? So we don't have to do these three lines all the time, we just have to update that w which was changed, which you know is nice, because if you basically create something like this, a library, then all you have to do is give somebody the object file, they could just link that object file with their code, and all they would need is the header file of your code, not the implementation. And that is exactly what a library is, right? So it, it makes the whole thing reusable. You could give them the CPP file, 
But if you give them also the object file, you, they will never have to recompile it unless you have a different architecture, a different computer, um, operating system, for instance. Right, and it saves also compilation time. So it takes usually a while to compile those functions in those object files, but once you have those object files, the linking is kind of gluing everything together. That goes quite fast, but the compiling takes a lot of time. So especially if you go for larger projects, um, so uh, OpenCV, for instance, then you basically uh, will know that compilation takes ages. If you can take just the object file already, because nothing has changed there, things will go a lot faster and we save time. So that is the reason why people use this .h and these .cpp files. And that's also how we have used it up until now. Like IOStream, for instance, is implemented exactly like that. Or ncurses.h is exactly implemented like that. Somebody created a header file and, and uh, CPP files that, uh, that were uh, um, uh, added to that. And that's how we then also are able to get ncurses. Right, so now we're going to have um, uh, an example uh, using maze game. Um, and we're going to implement it in exactly this way. We're going to create it as we saw before with a header file where we define our two functions, with a CPP file where we implement our two functions, and our maze.cpp file. So what we have to do is always we have to compile into an object file our draw maze.cpp. Draw maze.cpp has the header file in it, right? So it knows everything it needs to know about the functions that we provide. So up until now, we know everything, uh, or we can compile for those two functions everything we need. Then for our maze.cpp, where our main function is, we do exactly the same. In fact, there we don't even need any curses. Um, it's, it's implemented in uh, draw maze.h, that's what we already included there. Um, and other than that, you basically have to specify that we just compile the main function into objects, into an object file. And then at the last step, we link those two object files together with the ncurses library, and we create an executable called maze, right? So that is the nice thing, and if anything changes, so if we, our main function, for instance, over here does not change, we can leave this object file, and then all we have to do is change something in these files, add a new function, for instance, or change those functions, and all we have to do is then update this one. So then we have to just type this, and then we have to link the already existing object file with the new object file into our executable maze. And so that's how it works. Now, what we're going to see next is a utility that is as easy as that play button in your IDE that you have typically as a gra in a graphical way. You can also type make in the command line and it will automatically do all of this for you over here. Sounds too good to be true. It is in a way because it does require that knowledge still to be given. But then from then on, as soon as you created your files, all you have to do is type make and it will create the object files magically the ones that need, it, that need to be updated and it will recompile uh, your uh, executable at will. All you do is type make. Make is a function? Make is a, a f it's, it's, it's in your terminal a command and it's basically an executable written by somebody else and that make will do lots of things automatically. It will look at all your code, your CPP and header files and it will see which one have changed since the last time. And then for the ones that have changed, it will redo the object files. And then it will link all the object files and then create a new executable. It can also notice that nothing has changed. So if you then do make, then it will say nothing has changed. The executable is as it was before. And it won't need that much time. Can you see the link and then the arrow in the like header file by just pointing to it? Yes, then make will basically give you exactly the same output as G++ would do over here. Because of course what make does, it will also execute G++ in the background, right? And this is of course what you have when in your IDE as well. If you dare click the play button, you will typically have exactly these, uh, this feedback from your compiler, right? So that's it. In, in, in the background, this exactly is happening. But also I want to make sure that you know this, so also here on our very basic terminal interface, we have also this one command which makes things a lot easier. The price we have to pay, however, for that is that we have to specify for make what needs to be done. You know, which files need to be compiled and which things need to be linked together. Because make can't know this. 
And for that, we need to create a make file. Um, and in this make file, we have exactly that what we had before already. But it's basically a different type of uh, structure. What we have typically is the first line in a, that is not a comment. So comments are here starting with a hash. Um, and we basically say here that we have a rule called maze. So if you have do make, then this is the default rule. And then maze will be created. Maze depends on draw maze.o and maze.o. If those are not there yet, or if those are outdated, then those have to be recreated. Now, how do does uh, make know how, what to do there? Well, it goes to look for the rule maze.o and draw maze.o. Then it looks for the dependencies of those two. Maze.o depends on maze.cpp and draw maze.h. Whereas draw maze.o depends on draw maze.cpp and draw maze.h. That's exactly our dependency graph over here or how the structure of the files were uh, created, right? And then basically what we do there is we tell, or oh actually I, uh, I deleted here the line for creating maze.o. For that you should uh, uh, embed uh, the one that you saw in the last, actually I will do this also right now so that we can do this straight away. So over here we basically um, create maze.cpp, but we compile it, right? And that's it, more we don't need. So it will create the object file in that case that is, that is necessary. I have a little bit of a space problem, but anyway. So this is basically how, this is called, this file is called make file. It has no extension and it needs a capital M, by the way. And it's in the same directory as your code files. And then, uh, if this is working exactly the way it is, so these are our original lines, remember, then all you have to do is type make, and then recompiling, retrying your code will work, always and ever. Okay? I know this is, if this is the first time you see this, this is a very overwhelming. I don't expect you to know this for the exam, but it's important to know that in the background of all the IDEs, exactly this is happening. So if you compile something in Visual C, plus plus, then this make file is also there. Um, and this will also ha have exactly the same layout and the same setup. One extra thing that you should know about is that if we execute nano to create a text file, like make file over here as well, typically tabs are disabled. You can't type tab, it typically will replace the tab with two spaces because that's what we've been doing all the time. If you want to enable tabs, so if you want to create a new make file, you have to press escape, and then you have to press O, and then you will see an, a message in Nano saying, from now on, all the tabs that you insert are actual tabs, like a character which will jump uh, one tab with to the left. And then this needs to be a tab over here. So whenever uh, you have a rule, and then the dependencies of that rule, what needs to be executed, so the G++ command in our case always, will have to be preceded by a tab. Not two spaces like I just did, but an actual tab. Otherwise, uh, make will start complaining. All right? We'll do that in the exercises again and again still, but uh, again, it's, it's something nice to know, I think, but it's not critical for this course. All right. Now let's go and do that. Um, I'm not sure if we uh, will do immediately the whole um, make file implementation, but we're going to we don't need to save that. Um, I think I put everything to maze01 already. Yes. So let's see what maze.cpp is. Is holding. I think this is the last thing that we had, right? Oh, yeah. So this is basically all the code that we had. So we had, this is where we left off the last time. This was our first version of our maze game, so everything was crammed into one CPP file. Let's go out and then remove drawmaze.h as well as drawmaze.cpp so, and then also our executable. Um, actually, I can still see if everything works. So if we execute whatever we had before, we had this, right? All we had to do is execute this and then typically our executable would work. So if we create it in that case, we can move down, right, up, 
down, up, left, and so on. And we would have this graphical representation that we will need for our maze game. All in one go. Now what we do is we copy, um, no, we copy maze.cpp uh, to our two files. So draw maze.cpp as well as the header file. And we're going to implement the everything, or we're going to remove everything that is not necessary, as we had before. So we'll start with looking at our header file, because that's the easiest. All the header file does is, I'm going to do this later, so here we still need to fill in something, but all the, he the header file does is show the compiler what needs to be implemented, uh, uh, what needs to be defined as a function. So we don't need to implement anything, we just need to def define those two functions that we had. Um, and at the same time, we need to say that those two will also be linked to the ncurses library. And that is what we had in the slides as well. That is the header file, drawmaze.h, and that is what we're going to, in, uh, how we're going to wrap those two functions together. The same for the CPP file. In this case, we don't need to include ncurses. We can do this in one go. We basically include our drawmaze, oops, draw maze.h file where our um, uh, where our definitions of our functions were right so that is what we have over there and the cpp file will then implement those two functions init and curses and the draw function we don't need the main function at all in this file right so what we do now, G++, and we compile drawmaze.cpp, we need to make sure that we, oh, um, we need to link it to ncurses, because that's the library we're also using in our functions. But then when we do this, we will see that an object file has been created called drawmaze.o, right? We can even look at this to show you that it's machine code, right? This is the machine code that belongs to our two functions. Um, and this is basically uh, put together to create your executable in the end as well, right? So that is what is happening there. If we now go for our maze.cpp file, and that is the nice thing, of course, is that we don't need to include ncurses. We include our draw maze.h, and in and and all we need to do then is basically do whatever we have in our main function, right? So this is all that has changed. We divided up our functions and we let them point to each other. Our main function uses the functions that we have, init curses and draw, <coughs> and it knows that these are existing because they're in the header file, but the implementation of those functions are accessed by the object files that we already have compiled now, but that we just need to link to. So that's what we'll do now. So we go out, and just as we compiled the functions, we now are going to compile first the maze.cpp file. Um, and we don't need the ncurses uh, uh, library here because that's not ex explicitly used here. And then we have now two object files. We have maze.o, which we just created, and we had our draw maze.o, which is basically the the uh, machine code that belongs to our two functions. And if we want to link those, we just say we have maze.o, we have draw, oops, draw maze.o, uh, and we output now maze as an executable. And we have to also here include our ncurses library. Now we have recreated our maze function, which is just exactly the same as before. Right, so this is it. That is our new function. Now, we have a little bit of time, so I'm going to update now something in our function. And I'm going to update only something in the draw maze. So we go for draw maze dot, I'll do CPP first. So we have here our still outstanding problem, and this is kind of part of the homework that was on the slides. If I'm moving, I'm leaving a trail of my player which for some games might be cool. In this case, I don't want my player to leave a trail at all. I want my player to move around, but where our player was, I, should, I, I, I want to leave uh, the grass as it was, in this case, if that green thing is grass. 
There are multiple ways of doing that. There's a very efficient way by saying I print first where I was, a green block, and then where I will be, I print something else. Or you could do it because later we are going to add lots of other things. We might uh, add things moving in the surroundings of the player. We might want to create another function called redraw, um, which is basically drawing the entire the entire screen from scratch. Scratch. And all that this does is basically we call it redraw. We don't need anything uh, in terms of, uh, of parameters. We don't need anything in terms of a re return value. But what we'll do is it basically redraws the entire screen into one color. And the nice thing is we already have this. In our init and curses, this double for loop over here does exactly that. It goes for every character in our screen and uh, turns it green in this case, or a blue foreground dot in this case, and a green background. So if I cut this over here, where I set the color to green, or blue on green, and then with this for loop um, redraw everything, then I have everything that I need for our redraw function, right? So I put this into redraw, and of course what I, are, what I will be able to do here is call our redraw function. We already have it implemented here. Later in draw, draw maze on H, we'll have to also put this there as well, of course. Uh, that's what we can do here already. Um, so we, we open over here our draw maze. Oh, I'm not here in the right directory yet, right? No. So we go to the previous directory and then we go to maze 02. Yeah, there we are. And then we go to draw maze.h, which only has those two functions. All I need to do is add that function there as well. So we drawing the entire screen from scratch. And all it does is void, redraw, and that's it. So from now on, the compiler, when it first looks at everything, knows that there is this new function. And whenever we compile this uh, with the CPP file, we know that's what this function should do. And then the other functions, like init curses, will actually also do redraw. But that's not yet it. Basically what I want to do is, whenever I want to uh, draw our character, I also want to redraw um, the whole screen. So before I draw the character on a new position, it's a little bit um, excessive perhaps, but our computers are so fast nowadays that you won't see this or notice this. We basically refresh the entire screen, draw uh, blue dots on green backgrounds everywhere, and only then we switch to a new color and then draw our character. Right? So that's how we kind of implemented this. So what I changed now is draw maze.h and draw maze.cbp to have a third function. But that does, does not mean that we have to do all of that again. We basically just uh, have to recompile our draw maze.cpp, which is linking or which is including draw maze.h. And we have to make sure that we have to include the curses library, otherwise the compiler will complain. And now our new object file that was created over here, which is draw maze.o, needs to be linked to our old maze.o file. So basically we have G++ where we have maze.o, nothing changed there, but we have our draw maze.o, that was changed, and we output that to our executable again, um, and we link n curses as before, as the library n, not nurses, but n curses, there we go. And if we then, uh, so everything went fine. I had no, no errors, which is amazing. Um, that typically, uh, there, there will be errors in the coming weeks, I'm sure. But then when we move our character, you'll see that it goes so fast, but really in the background, our screen constantly gets redrawn. So it will do this as I press those keys. It will redraw the entire screen and then draw at a new XY position my, uh, my player again, until I press quit for quit, okay? <coughs> so this is a, a, a part of this, uh, uh, of this homework. Now, of course, there's other functions and other functionalities you can start adding here as well. All you have to do is what I just did, 
And all you have to do is create the make file as you just saw it as well. And then all you have to do is then not uh, go for this uh, quite laborsome uh, G++ plus, minus C, these object files. You just type make and then it will work. All it needs to do make is a make file. So no make file was found in this case. You need to create a make file text file as you see in the slides. And then you can just type make and it will automatically recompile what needs to be recompiled, which is a lot nicer. So I would also, um, as a homework thing, say, try to create a make file and see if it works for you. Because it will, for larger projects, be absolutely necessary that you understand how this works. And there is no difference between this type of project and an extremely large uh, project uh, that is also written in C++. It's always the same. You have header files and CPP files that create functionality that are uh, wrapped up in object files, and those, those object files are linked together into an executable. And once you understand that, you know, it, it's not that hard, really. Okay, any questions? No, in that case, I wish you a nice day. The new um, exercise or new assignment will come online again this afternoon, so look out for that one. So you can already start before tomorrow morning's exercise session. And I thank you for your attention and coming. Have a nice week.